bit of a wrap up on uh, chapter 15. It's 15, right? Okay, so the physical world is interested in the measurement of physical. This blank is quantities. Um, so I, I think we talked about this, but yeah, when you're, if you measure something, so if you measure a length, a length is considered a physical quantity. It's something that you can measure. It's something that is measurable. Um, what else did we measure? Oh, we measured mass. Okay, you take something and you put it onto a mass balance. You are measuring a physical quantity. Okay, so that's kind of a general term for all the different things that you can measure in physics. So the physical world is interested in the measurement of physical quantities, ways of measuring them. So, ooh, I'm not going to fit this. Anyway, you get the idea. So ways of measuring them. Um, so anytime we talked about a new quantity, we always talked about instruments. We talked about what instruments are used to measure them and then kind of how to accurately use those instruments, um, like the tear button on the mass balance, for example. Um, and the relationship between them. Um, so I suppose that's different quantities. So maybe like measuring something in centimeters and converts it into meters or even like when you're doing like a derived unit so you have like speed equals distance divided by time or your volume was length by width by height um different things like that in the 1960s many scientists had agreed on a common system of measure of measurement of physical quantities called the metric system <laughs> And this paved the way for the SI. Sorry, um, actually I'm assuming they're going there for SI unit of measurement. Uh, the SI unit for time, we did all of these. Actually, that was while I was still there. So is the second length is the meter and mass is the kilogram. Okay, so we spoke about SI units, there is an agreed unit that they use, that is used um, to measure these in. It's not always the most appropriate, so a lot of the times you have to measure in a non-SI unit. Um, so for example, when you were measuring the length of your science copy, you measure that in centimetres because that's appropriate, and then you convert it into metres because that's SI. Okay, so there's an awful lot of that in physics. You you must be aware of what an appropriate unit is, measure in an appropriate unit, and then do whatever conversions are necessary using your maths skills. Um, a unit that has been produced from combining basic units is known as derived. It's known as a derived unit. Uh, to measure accurate width, thicknesses, and lengths, you use a... I'm assuming because there's two gaps, they're talking about a vernier calipers there. Um, but you could also use a micrometer with technically, yeah. You could also use a micrometer there. Okay, so the vernier calipers is the one that kind of has the two that looks terrible, but like kind of two prongs like that, and then it goes down like this. And you can move this closer or further away, and then there's a way of reading it down here. The something of an object is the measure of how much matter is in it. That's the mass of an object. The amount of space an object takes up. That's its volume. Remember we talked about space or another word I used was capacity. And um, if you want to measure the volume of liquid, you can use a volume of a liquid. It has to be a graduated cylinder. Uh, make sure your readings are taken at the, make sure to take your readings at, oh, that's eye level and from the bottom of the meniscus. Now, I'm not sure if we talked about this actually because I wasn't in class for this one. So when you put liquid into a tube, now, I'm massively exaggerating this, right? But there's a thing that happens at the edges here. It's called capillary action. 
know if there's another eye in that, but anyway, it's called capillary action. And it's where the water, when it meets the glass at the side, kind of creeps up the side. So you get this sort of arced effect on the top of the water um, or any liquid. No, it's not as extreme as I'm trying, I'm showing you here. Like it's nowhere near that extreme. Um, but there is a dip in the center and that dip there is referred to as the meniscus. So when you read something, um, when you read the level of liquid um, in a graduate cylinder, thermometer, anything like that, um, you have to get down on eye level. So you your eye would need to be, you know, I'll delete this, but your eye needs to be in this general area, okay? So you can't like stand up here and look down on it and you can't be down here looking up at it. Um, we actually, would you believe, had this problem in the hospital the other day. Um, Fionn has drains and those drains are draining fluid from his lungs. And I watched the nurse take the measurement and she never, she ne the, the drain is on the floor and she did it from standing. And she wrote the reading down and she said to me, oh, there's a lot coming out there today. He's at 100 or whatever. And I, when she left the room, I went over and had a look. I got down on my knees and I was at eye level with the thing. And she had misread it by about 80 mils, which in the context of what Fionn was doing was a lot. But it's because she didn't get down at eye level. So it's very, very important when you're reading um, the measurement that you're on eye level with it. Um, and then when you are reading the level of a liquid, you measure from the bottom of this arc. So not up here where the liquid has kind of creeped up the side of the glass. You measure from the bottom. Okay, so from down here and that's the bottom of the meniscus. Okay, and again, your eye needs to be at this level. So like... I know in physics class sometimes that requires people standing up on a chair to make sure they're getting the right reading from the thermometer or um, even in chemistry if you're using a burette, a burette is a really really long thin glass tube Um, it's like is it about 0.8 of a meter long so sometimes it's right up in the air because it's clamped up in a retort stand you have to just get up on the table you must be at eye level okay so I'm not sure if we actually discussed that maybe we did and now I've just re-discussed it anyway it's important when measuring with a faulty technique or when there is a difference between the reaction times of two people take the measurement, this is known as a random error. Um, and when this type of error occurs, it will stand out as an outlier. So that's not where you're making a mistake every single time. That's just where there was a mistake made. Um, like, say, person one on the team was taking all the readings and for whatever reason, they said to person two, listen, will you read it there that time? And there was a clear difference between the readings. There's one I can think of from Leave Insert where you have to, you have to get an image and you have to focus the image. And I'm always, I always find it hilarious when I ask students that you have to get it into focus. It has to be in sharp focus. So like it's like taking a picture, and you have to wait for the camera to come into focus. And um, the difference between what one person thinks is in focus compared to what another person thinks is in focus is like crazy. So you get totally different readings. Um, so for things like that it's kind of important that one person does all the readings um, you would think there's no discrepancy between what one person thinks is in focus and what another person thinks is in focus but that actually isn't the case and um, that idea of human error and that the same person should do the calculations or the observations not necessarily the calculations sorry the observations um, is quite important and um, if you want to measure a volume of what am I doing We've done that already, haven't we? Where am I missing a question? Hang on. Sorry, no. Yeah. Oh, I did repeat the question. Okay, sorry about that. That was an accident. Uh, so yeah, anyway, there was a J. Obviously, I just put H in again. So yeah. Uh, hopefully that's okay. Um, I think, I could be wrong, but I think the only thing I didn't mention going through that chapter was the meniscus and reading from the bottom of it and all that stuff. Um, so yeah, that's chapter 15, an introduction into physics. So we'll keep going with chapter 17. Um, chapter 17 is motion. Um, now that is not 
kind of it seems like a very simple thing there's actually a lot in this okay in this chapter you're going to learn different types of motion how to analyze the motion of different objects what forces are and what they can do how balanced and unbalanced forces affect motion and why objects float and sink okay so this is an introduction to what we would call it leave insert we would call it mechanics okay so it's literally the world of forces and how they affect motion um, and you know this is a huge body of work at leave insert like this takes months for five months of fifth year to get through so this what we're going to do here is very much an introduction into it um but it is you know it's a huge chunk of because even though we do it you, you learn about forces and stuff in mechanics like forces are pretty much you know that's what physics is it's about the forces acting between different objects like from tiny 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 little objects like something inside an atom or something inside the nucleus of an atom to huge objects like planets and universes and things like that and um, so that, I mean that's kind of what physics is about it's about the forces that hold the universe together from the very very small ones to the very very large ones and um, so yeah this is an incredibly important introduction into physics and um, so the first thing here is types of motion you don't need to take it down in like a little circular thing like this and um, just different types of motion so we have the first guy here where we're talking about le uh, motion left and right so like a horizontal motion and um, do a lot of work around horizontal motions like um someone running i suppose um if you were to take a little toy car and push it along the ground um those kind of back and forth like a car driving down the road and apply the brakes so the car slows down that all that is left and right motion it's horizontal motion and um, motion in a circle uh so that's like i mean I, we're not going to do much about motion in a circle at junior cert like that's a very kind of complicated area of leave insert physics it's actually not even leave insert ordinary level physics so the circular motion is difficult and um, the forces involved are a little bit more complicated um, but yeah that's another kind of motion and what happens when you have motion in a circle it's quite interesting uh, motion up and down so either something falling like this guy is skydiving I assume um, so like you take something uh, and you drop it it falls okay what's going on there what's the force that's involved i'm sure you know what it is um or else you can go uh in the opposite direction where you take something and you throw it up in the air like what happens there what happens when it reaches its max height things like that and um, floating and sinking so that is to do with um up thrust and buoyancy and density and different things like that and um, and then the last one then is turning things so that's like um torque and they're called couples the forces because if you want to like like your man there trying to open a jar you need two forces acting in opposite directions and um, in order to get that turning effect and um, uh, yeah so they're the again you just need a list really and we're going to go through uh in some amount of detail the different forces so starting here we're going to talk about the the link i suppose between all of these um, and again you know with limited uh, depth we're going to go through this and um, distance speed and time okay so like my example of throwing the car along the the bench there in the science lab or somebody running or uh, taking a car that's traveling at a speed and applying the brakes and um, even taking something that is in your hand and is not moving and dropping it and it starts to move, you know anything like that okay so at I suppose a nice basic level we have distance speed and time now a lot of those um will be a little bit more complicated so there'll be acceleration but we'll get there we're just going to start with distance speed and time okay so distance is measured in meters we know that um i don't know why time is in second i would put distance first i would put time second time is measured in seconds and then the third one is a derived unit and um, i think we use this actually as one of our examples so it is a combination of both distance and speed. Um, the distance an object travels in a given time is measured in meters per second. Remember we discussed the unit, we'll tell you the formula. So meters per second is the same as meters over seconds. 
meters, remember, is distance. Seconds is time. Distance on the top, time on the bottom, and that's where the formula comes from. Okay, so you can use the units to get the formula, distance over time. Okay, distance, speed, and time. Now, this is a very much a leave insert kind of thing. Um, this would never have been taught on the old course. Um, but distance, speed, and time are what are called scalar quantities. Okay, so we'll discuss them as we go on. But basically, all quantities, remember, quantities are just something we measure, are either scalars or they are vectors. Okay, that's an or. They're either scalars or vectors. Okay, so scalars or sorry vectors have direction okay so when we talk about speed distance or time if you take like the speedo on your car um you know that's a circular dial like this and it has like 10 kilometers per hour 20 30 40 all the way around it goes up to about 140 on the far side and then the little dialy thing like rotates around depending on how fast you go right it gives you the speed of the car it does not tell you which direction you're going in okay so i don't know if a car had stopped you and says like do you know what speed you were doing back there you wouldn't say oh i was doing 120 kilometers per hour east guard you know you would just say i'm doing 120 kilometers per hour that's speed and that's a scalar quantity Okay, so it do, if it doesn't have a direction, it's a scalar. If it has a direction, it's a vector. Okay, so distance, speed, and time. Like time. What time is it there, Mary? And mm -hmm. Mary says it's half two. You don't say it's half two west. It doesn't make any sense. Okay, so time is a scalar because there isn't an obvious direction. Now, distance I will talk about, okay, because... I mean, the speed is kind of the same, but distance is essentially if you, I don't know, say go into a park here, this is you in the park and you're going to run five kilometers and you're going to go like around this loop and you might do the loop, I don't know, three times and you finish up here. Okay. The distance you traveled was five kilometers and you went in this sort of circular oval type path. Okay. You don't have a direction. You don't say I went a little bit north, a little bit east, a little bit south, a little bit west, you just say I travelled five kilometres or I, I ran a distance of five kilometres. You don't mention direction. Okay, so that's the difference between scalars and vectors. I think it says it here. So scalar quantities have magnitude. Now I would say they have magnitude, I would add to that, they have magnitude only. Okay, magnitude is a fancy word for size. So when you give a scalar quantity, you say the time was 16 seconds that 16 is a magnitude it's a size it's a it's a measurement of time you do not say 16 seconds east that doesn't make any sense which means time is a scalar quantity it has magnitude only okay um, it goes on to explain it there. They do not take place in any direction. For example, the speedometer in a car tells you how fast the car is going, but gives no information on the direction the car is moving. Okay, so scalar quantities, they have magnitude only. There is no direction indicated. Okay, right. So I went through the homework. Make sure you got that right. Take down your five types of basic motion or movement. Um, we're going to try and, uh, I suppose, talk about that movement and analyze it in terms of distance, speed, and time. So if you're going to move, you're going to cover a distance. Um, again, if you're going to move, you're going to cover a distance. How long does it take you to cover that distance? And based on those two quantities, remember that distance and time are your base units. Okay, so they're the ones we measure. And if you measure them, you can figure out your derived unit quantity. And that's normally one we calculate. Okay, so generally in physics, you wouldn't be 
measuring a derived unit that's not how you do it now i realize obviously we have a speedometer in a car there are devices available to measure speed directly but as a physics student you wouldn't measure speed directly speed is a derived unit so it's a calculated unit you measure distance and time and you calculate speed okay how do you calculate speed it's in the box here distance divided by time and then just this new concept we learned of a scalar quantity okay a scalar is something with no direction okay so I have a nice little bit of homework here um it's a speed distance time question so you have the formula up here um what I want you to take account of uh is the units okay the units are a mess so this is kilometers per hour and it should be meters per second this is years and it should be seconds and see can you figure out how to calculate how far so we're trying to calculate distance how far away the sun is okay it is one question but it's much trickier than it looks okay so give it a little bit of time see can you figure it out Again, if I was in school, I would want to see three or four goes at this calculation. I am not expecting many people to get this right. As I said, this is tough, but I want you to have a little battle with it. I want you to see if you can figure it out. And if you can't, that's fine. But I'd like you to be able to look at your like second version and be like, oh my God, I was close there. Or, oh, I nearly got it right in my third go. So give it, set a timer, maybe give this question. 15 minutes and attempt it as many ways as you can in 15 minutes and if at the end of 15 minutes you still don't have it or you don't think you have it that's fine but please 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 don't leave the page blank okay you won't learn anything from that but it's a really really nice um physics question that looks really simple but is actually a little bit more complicated than that okay so give that a go and i will correct that for you on uh, Friday isn't it and we'll move on in the chapter all right I will talk to you then